this little video series is called Dying Dar's Way, Radically Real Spiels on the End of Life. I'm here today with my friend Jeff Vamos, who is Pastor Ves Jeff Vamos from the Presbyterian Church of Lawrenceville. I had an issue that I could not handle by myself. I have become extremely sensitive to the suggestions and the criticisms as my death nears. Not that anybody is trying to specifically be critical, but that's how I've been receiving certain things. I've been able to, I've been able to filter out dopey comments like, did you smoke? When somebody finds out that it's lung cancer. I mean, it's just the human condition that people, people, I don't know, they're a little gossipy or something. Anyway, um, these can be very painful. So I'm filtering those out. I'm doing pretty well. And I just chalk these little painful moments up to being human. Um, there's been a barrage of advice. I have learned to turn advice into a love language. Like if somebody starts talking to me about mushrooms or spiritual healers or there's a doctor out in Colorado or anything like that, I just accept this as a way of their saying, I, I love you. And so I interpret it as a, a love language. Um, I've dealt with people's uh, projection of sadness and anger on to me, processed all of that. Um, I am actually here, I want to show you something, it's January, and I find myself identifying more with nature. This is from a young oak tree, and it's sort of, you can't really tell, are the trees hanging on to the leaves, or the leaves hanging on to the trees, but whatever it is, the leaves don't look like they're very happy, but it's their time to go. So I'm feeling very much into my role as one small organism in an environment, and it's simply my time to go. But there is one thing that I have not been able to get past, and that is being condemned by a Christian as I face death. So I asked Pastor Jeff Vamos to come and talk about this issue of condemning someone um, for not having accepted Jesus Christ as the one and only true savior by the time you meet your maker. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah help, well. Help me out here. <laughs> I, I do have some thoughts about that. Good. And, um, I, I wanna try and be kind of a little brief and you can, uh, I, I don't know that I will be brief, but I have some thoughts about that. Um, that begin with this door, I was just kind of horrified that um, that happened to you, mm -hmm. and I just, I want to apologize on behalf of all Christians <laughs> for that. Um, and so here are just maybe two, two and a half ideas about this okay. whole business of the afterlife and what that's all about, you know. I think, first of all, that this guy who said you're not going to heaven or you're going to hell or whatever he said uh, is really acting way above his pay grade. <laughs> I'll, say, I'll say something more about that. Um, okay. But, you know, I think that that person clearly uh, is lacking compassion, and that is the, the center of gravity for this tradition, compassion, mercy. Mm -hmm. And anytime <clears throat> we don't act out of that, we're in error, um, I think. But there is, there is something in, in that that we probably should be aware of, mm -hmm. and to get wax theological here. And, and so it's something that I struggle with, is the idea is that there's something really consequential about what we believe, you know? It matters what we believe. Mm -hmm. As I could say, you know what? I don't believe in gravity, <laughs> you know? Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna obey the laws of gravity, and so there are consequences to that. So it's a tradition where there's the idea that, we ha that what we believe has some pretty profound consequences. Um, uh, but the other thing I wanna share is, so, so there, there's a, a tension between what I believe, you know, I believe passionately in Jesus, but also need to be profoundly open to people who believe differently. And that's part of the tradition that I'm practicing. And you house yeah. Temple Micah. Exactly. At the Presbyterian Church. He's the home to Temple Micah. Yeah. So. And I like to think of that as part of the, uh, the ethic of being a Christian is being open to others. Mm -hmm. While we also sort of say, I believe really passionately in this. And that's a tension I don't know that I will ever resolve, but... Um, but here's the here's the more important point I think. Okay. Um, 
In the tradition that I practice, I'm a Presbyterian, we have this really super duper clear idea that we don't know who's going to heaven. As way above my pay grade. If there is a heaven, and that's a kind of, um, I think of heaven as an imaginative concept that helps us understand something that it can't be understood with the human mind. And you no know, one's ever died and come back. Well, I could say, well, we might think there's one exception right? uh, to that. Who said, I've seen what it's like, and I'm, I'm here to help you understand that there's a way uh, beyond it, um, that, that life extends beyond death. But um, uh, we are not to go around determining who goes to heaven or hell. Um, if anybody does that, it's God who does that. Um, and we are not to judge. I'm a big fan of the Divine Comedy. I don't know if you, you know, it's Dante. Mm -hmm. uh, it's this famous Dante's Inferno. Inferno all that. Right. He writes this really hugely long poem about uh, hell and purgatory and heaven. And, and the reason I bring that up is it's just some wacky people who make it to heaven. And you're like, okay. what? You know, people who are real, were real jerks. So the idea is that, you know, this person who looks like they're going straight to hell, I just know they're going, no. God might have chosen them and might have chosen people, not chosen in that concept, people who seem like they, they're certainly going to heaven. So the point is that we don't know. Uh, the last, I said, two and a half quick points. Um, we don't know if there's heaven, hell, however that plays out. Uh, we don't decide that. Right. But the, I, I want to share a quote with a great theologian, a very challenging name to pronounce, a guy named Hans Urs von Balthasar. Von that's Balthasar. A, that's okay. a mouthful. Uh -huh. uh, he's a famous Roman Catholic theologian. And so he deals with this question, you know, is it possible everybody goes to heaven? It's called universalism. There are people who believe that, you know. But it, That's sort you know, of what I project. Yeah. So, yeah. so here's the thing. Like, Jesus was all about showing love for people who don't deserve it. And let's face it, you know, if we, none of us really can say we deserve it, like we earned it. Look, I've been a good little boy. I deserve to go to heaven. And right. then you lose the whole point of the thing. Right. No. And so why should that end at death, right? I mean, Jesus was all about not necessarily getting people into heaven. He was more about bringing heaven to us where mm -hmm. we're living. Um, and so this is the profound thing, and then I'll be quiet. Um, you know, he, his thing is, is everybody getting into heaven? We have to hope so. We don't know, but we have to hope so, because that's the trajectory of the whole thing, you know, Jesus loving people who didn't deserve it, you know, people who were kind of, you know, um, questionable. And really, again, we're all sort of, we say we, maybe we're not going to measure up, but that's the whole idea of grace. Maybe we all get in. I, I, I had, tend to think that's, if you kind of follow it all the way out there. Von Balthasar. Hans Urs right? von Balthasar, von, yeah. Von Balthasar. Well, I'll See, that, have to that, look that up. See, that, that's four times. <laughs> Anyway, that's my little soliloquy on how I think of all that yeah. stuff. And again, I just am so sad that that person said that to you. It is the most uncompassionate thing I can think of. So it's the only thing I've really had to process for weeks, months, really, that I couldn't, I couldn't take care of myself. And and I'll tell you briefly why it's so. Um, palpable for me right now. I've been studying adverse childhood experiences and the research around the health consequence, mental health consequences for people who have had at least four of these things. They were abused as children. They're, somebody in their family was incarcerated. You know, they weren't loved or fed it regularly as a child. And the risk for everything goes, you know, through the roof. Diabetes, drug use, you know, all of the risky behaviors. And I can't Imagine living in a world where someone who has grown up, was born into that level of abusive childhood. I cannot imagine a God in a heaven where somebody would be judged whose entire context was mm -hmm. abuse. So mm -hmm. anyway, that's what, that's what has been driving my energy around this question. Mm -hmm. So you deal on a regular basis with a lot of the practical matters involved with dying and grieving. He's the, he's the minister at a fairly large congregation in, in Lawrenceville. Um, what, what do you do? Yeah. 
Well, I don't know that there's necessarily a magic answer to that, but there, there may be ways, not, things not to do. I think it might be easier to... Very important you've what not to do. I've a lot of... A those. dozen vid videos on what you absolutely should not yeah, do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, in my experience, giving advice is, uh, is, is not necessarily indicated there. You know, it's trying to... Um, just be with the person in that act is maybe mm -hmm. the most important thing. Um, it keeps on coming up over and over. Just be present. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, and that said, it's not always easy to do because people are nervous and they want to fill the silence yes. with their own thoughts. Fill the silence. And, do you hear that? You know, <laughs> it's <laughs> so uncomfortable for some people, but sometimes yeah. all you need is a yeah. little bit of contact or even no touch, just presence. Yeah, yeah. I'll be with you. Um, but it, it's, uh, and it's not rocket science, um, but it's just trying to be present and mindful of people. Um, I find, too, that, you know, kind of being where people are then, too, if they need to talk about, like, this horrible experience that a Christian <laughs> inflicted upon you. You know, that, that let, I'd really love to talk about that. Um, but I'm, more important is... Uh, how do you feel about it? And what feelings are you bringing to that? Okay, you know? this is a really important point. So my degree is in counseling. And there are various models about how to be with people while you're trying to give them a therapeutic or share a therapeutic experience. And the answer is not always the most clever way yeah, to yeah. draw information yeah. out of people. It's yeah. just not yeah. <laughs> the, right. the most humane way to go. It might work with some people, but some people are underexpressed and are better off remaining under right. underexpressed. Yeah. So it might have been better for me to say, Dor, what are your ideas about the afterlife? You know, instead of my fancy theological concepts. You know what? I should you have had I mean? a minister like, here before. I should have but you said you didn't want to talk and you wanted me anyway. So but I can <laughs> I can I can answer that question um, just at a very personal level. What I don't believe is that the arms of hell open up their flames to me and engulf me the moment that I die. I think that either it's dust to dust. I'm an organic gardener. That doesn't sound at all bad to me. You know, here I am identifying mm. with it's time to go. Then, then you're part of that. And I'm part of that. But the rest of it is I am so taken with these near-death experiences where almost everybody has the same take on it. It's like, doctor, why did you bring me back from whatever it was, cardiac arrest? I saw the white light. I was in the most beautiful place. I never felt so much love and acceptance in my life. And that's really very common to people who've had these near-death experiences. So it's either not bad or it's good. That's how I see it. It's not going to be bad. And it might be the most beautiful thing that ever happened to us. I vote yeah. for that. I love that. I, mean, I, <laughs> I love that that's the exploration that you're doing. Yeah. And that this, and I have to say, I just, I get a little teary eyed because I, I think it's such a great example that you're, you're giving to people in making use of this experience in your life. Yeah. And you're, you're dying with a great deal of life. Well, that's, you know, I, I was given so much. I've had all of the advantages of a white middle-class person who was born in a nice neighborhood, completely safe at all times to parents who prized an education. And I've really had a lot of unearned benefits hmm. because of that. So I feel like I should be teaching everything I know and doing programs for yeah. free. And I know him because I've run so many um, programs out of the church, we have a mutual interest in community wellness, mm -hmm. and that's the, the foundation on which our relationship was built. And man, if you have a life like me and don't come out with a sense of service, something went wrong. That's just yeah. how I see it. Something yeah. went wrong if you aren't oriented towards service. Well, so I say anyway, amen to that. Yeah, I say amen too. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this with me.